Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I'm Andy Linehan, president of the City Club. Welcome to City Club and a program on the Oregon Health Plan featuring Representative Jeff Cruz from Roseburg and Jean Thorne, who's the director of the Oregon Department of Human Services. Representative Alan Bates from Ashland had, been, had planned to participate today, but as we know, the state's budget is far from uh, settled. It's, there's at least a billion dollars left to discuss, and he needs to stay in Salem for, for Ways and Means Committee meeting today. Before we begin our, begin our program, I have the usual few items of City Club business. Uh, next Friday, July 25th, will be the last Friday forum of this season, and please join us then to join to hear three members of our own club who are representatives in, in uh, Salem, representatives Bradovakian, Mitch Greenlick, and Greg McPherson, and they'll discuss their first term in the legislature. As I mentioned, there are no Friday programs in August. You'll have to do without your usual Friday afternoon stimulation uh, for an entire month. So. Uh, the research board is looking for volunteers for a committee to study one of the more controversial ballot measures of, of recent years, the proposed People's Utility District. Uh, this ballot measure has qualified for the November ballot. Uh, the committee is forming now and will probably begin meeting in August. So if you're interested, please contact our research director, Wade Fickler, at the club. Finally, I'd like to draw your attention to the article on the Oregon Health Plan that was published with this week's bulletin. This article was written by the City Club's Health uh, Healthcare Issues Committee, which is sitting at two of our front tables here. Perhaps you'd be willing to stand up, committee members. There we go, these two committees. Um, this uh, report is, is really uh, excellent. It provides background information on the Oregon Health Plan for today's program. It's been so popular, in fact, that we've uh, given out all hard copies of it, and, but it is still available on our website. Uh, check it out at www.pdxcityclub.org. I'd like to thank, in particular, the committee's co-chairs, Ted Falk and Dave Cook, and also the staff of the uh, Department of, of uh, Human Services, uh, Jean Thorne's department, in helping provide the, or pull together the information for this little report. Uh, I'd also like to thank the members of the Health Care Issues Committee for putting together this program today and the thoughtful work that went on to come up with the panel of speakers. I um, should also note that the same issue committee, an active one, is writing a more comprehensive information report on the health care safety net and that uh, report should be published in October, so look forward to that. Broadcast of City Club programs this quarter is made possible in part with support from Wells Fargo Bank, Legacy Health Systems, and Weyerhaeuser Company Foundation. We are very grateful for their support. When it was enacted in 1994, the Oregon Health Plan drew national attention as one of those Oregon policy in innovations for which the state is well known. It was viewed as a fair and rational way to increase the proportion of our citizens with adequate, adequate health care coverage. Now, less than a decade later, rising health care costs and shrinking state revenues threaten some of the basic goals of the Oregon Health Plan. With us today are two people who have had a key role in shaping the past and present of the Oregon Health Plan. Jean Thorne, who will speak first, directs the Oregon Department of, of Human Services, Oregon's largest state agency. She holds a master's degree in public administration and a bachelor's degree in sociology, both from PSU. Ms. Thorne was state Medicaid director at the Department of Human Services from 1987 to 1995, and in that role was in instrumental in implementing the Oregon Health Plan. She worked in Governor Kitzhaber's office from 1995 through 2002, serving first as federal policy coordinator and later as the governor's education and workforce policy advisor. She was named Department of Human Services director effective uh, January this year. With uh, Gene Thorne is Jeff Cruz, Republican representing parts of Douglas and Lane counties. He is a lifelong farmer and resident of Douglas County. He grew up in the Roseburg area and graduated with a degree in economics from Willamette University. He's the co-owner of Cruz Farms. He was elected to the House in November of 1996, and this is his fourth uh, session. He was appointed as a member of the House Health and Human Services Committee in 1997 and appointed chair of that committee in 1999, 2001, and 2003. Uh, he and Representative Alan Bates have been leaders of the Oregon House of Representatives' current efforts to reform and save the Oregon Health Plan. Thank you. Good afternoon. Um, it's interesting looking around at some of the people here. When I look back over the many, many years of, of crafting the health plan and and struggling to get federal approval and then implementing it. I'm just looking over here, Ralph Croshaw, and Bob Shoemaker, two of the, the people I got to know very well way, way back when, when we were all younger. Um, 
I, I've been asked today to, to set the stage a little bit of, of some history around the health plan, what has occurred over the years, um, and uh, where we are now. And, and it's interesting because, as was noted, I was away uh, working on education. In fact, I think the last time I was at City Club, I was talking about education reform. And so a lot of times I say, well, I know that happened while I was gone, and I'm not too sure about it. But I've been able to reconstruct a few things. Uh, but I think we, we definitely are at a, definitely a turning point for the Oregon Health Plan. And I just have to say, I guess, to start with that I'm feeling definitely more hopeful today um, than I was a few months ago um, that we will be able to maintain uh, something that will allow us to, to when, when times are better, hopefully grow to some of what we had originally vision, envisioned. Um, first of all, I think the piece that's been done by the Health Care Committee really is an excellent piece, and I don't know how many of you have it with you today, but I started looking at it yesterday and said, well, that kind of covers about everything I'd want to say. Uh, but l going back a little bit, really the, the issue around the need for health care policy for our state uh, um, arose in 1987 and 1988, and where we really had very intense discussions, and many of you may remember a uh, decision made in 1987 uh, to discontinue funding for organ transplants and at the same time provide coverage for, for pregnant women and some pregnant women and low-income children who had not had it before. And the death of, death of Kobe Howard really led to a huge debate in the state. Um, and again, I think um, Ralph and, and Bob certainly, and probably others of you were part of that. Um, and so the, and as we moved into the 1989 session, of really saying we need to do something and, and try to establish a health care policy for the state since it didn't look like it was going to happen nationally. And in fact, I don't think anyone had recognized there was no national health care policy at that point. And so there were a number of principles that really drove uh, the establishment of what became the Oregon Health Plan, and that was with that we needed to try to get as close to universal access as possible because the 400,000 Oregonians at the time who didn't have health care coverage, when they showed up to the hospital emergency room and couldn't pay their bills, those costs were shifted to other payers. So in one way or another, we were paying for health care costs for the uninsured. How could we get closer to universal coverage? How could we have a package of benefits that really made the most sense, that focused on the most effective treatment? Um, how could we have a process that really established some accountability both on the public sector in terms of what we did cover and not cover? How did we balance expenditures for health against ex other expenditures for services that might affect a person's health as much or more, such as food and housing and clothing? Um, and so in 1989 is when a series of bills were passed. Uh, some of them dealt with health care technologies and small market insurance reform. The two major components really were around expanding and reforming the state meta federal state Medicaid program, and secondly, establishing an employer mandate, a pay or play, either you provide coverage or you pay into a pool. Um, and it was actually the employer mandate that um, was going to have the most significant effect in, in terms of reducing the percentage of those who are uninsured. Um, the mandate did not happen through, I won't get into all the uh, 19, I see Senator, ex Senator Shoemaker rolling his eyes what happened in 1993. Um, but so the focus really has been on what did we do in Medicaid and what have we done in Medicaid. And the Oregon Health Plan is thought of then as just being Medicaid. And I, I guess I just wanted to note the original concept was that it was more than that. Um, the, the components of the Medicaid reform were, were very simple, really. It was to say we should cover everyone who's living in poverty um, with public health care coverage, whether they fit into a federal category of coverage or not. And so if you were low in low enough income and you were elderly or disabled or a family with dependent children or pregnant or children under certain ages, you would qualify under a traditional Medicaid program, which is for our state, about 60% federal match, um, so 60 cents of, of every dollar is, is federal. But if you just happen to be poor and didn't fit into any of those categories, you would not qualify. So we said the public program should cover everyone under poverty and that the benefits that should be provided should be based on a, a public process of prioritization where we're actually looking at which services for it, uh, did the greatest good for, for given conditions, that we ought to focus those resources on those before we move to perhaps treatments that were less effective. That we ought to provide services as much as possible through managed care. 
because it was managed care that would really assure access. Now, on the fee-for-service side, we always paid crummy, we still pay crummy. And so someone could have a medical card but never get in to see anyone. Managed care allows us an assurance that there is access. When we pay a managed care plan to provide services to a Medicaid, to a health plan client, the managed care plan is responsible for assuring access to care and for coordination of care. But what we wanted to do was then also say, let's pay reasonable rates um, through managed care. We're not gonna pay, if we want providers to take on responsibility for assuring access and for coordination of care, we'll pay reasonable rates in that system because we want to encourage providers to participate in managed care. So after a long, long battle um, with the federal government where we were turned down and then we were finally approved, uh, we began the Oregon Health Plan, what was known as the Oregon Health Plan in February of 1994. And when I look back on those days, it's pretty amazing. Um, we had, um, just to give you a sense of, I guess, the pent-up demand, we had contracted with a company to operate the call center to take calls from people who were interested in getting an application to see if they might qualify. We had estimated we'd probably have 5,000 calls in the first month. We had 4,000 calls per day for at least the first couple of weeks. Uh, people crying on the phone talking about how they have gone without health care coverage for so long. But the stories I would hear from the staff there were just extraordinary about people who were so desperate. And we very quickly grew the program. Um, we had, I think within six months, 76,000 people were in the program who normally would not qualify for Medicaid coverage. And I think at its peak, we were up over 100,000 of people in the program who would not normally qualify for Medicaid coverage. So what that has meant over the years is that we've had to look at a number of mechanisms for controlling costs. On the benefits side, we have moved the line on the priority list a number of times. Um, we met with quite a bit of resistance to doing that um, from the Clinton administration, a little more acceptance from the current Bush administration. I have to say the current Bush administration because the former Bush administration turned us down completely on the waiver. Um, and we currently have a request in to move another 30 lines on that. But we did a number of things in the eligibility area um, to, I guess, tighten up on eligibility. And there always are concerns by people of, are you letting people into this program who may be undeserving? Well, when we started the program, we had no assets test. We didn't think it, you should require someone to spend all of their savings, perhaps on one hospital visit, before you would provide them coverage for basic care. Well, within a couple of years, then it moved to a $5,000 assets test, and then later to a $2,000 assets test, I meaning you can't have more than $2,000 in income you could access. So it really does, it, it, that created, I think, a barrier for many people to come into the program. Um, in the mid-90s, we implemented premiums for those, again, the, the people who would not normally have, have coverage. Now the federal requirements around that were that we could not kick someone off the plan for non-payment of premiums. When they, but the, when their six months of eligibility came up, at that point, if they hadn't paid their premiums, they would not re-enroll. But there was, a, you know, we had a fairly good, I think, 72% payment rate um, over time, we've had enhanced uh, verification of all sorts of um, requirements. Um, I will just say that the, the very slim application that we started out with is much lengthier now than, than initially was. And I think uh, if, if any of you who have the, the background or piece with you, you'll, you'll see that in the that you know, basically in the mid-90s, we flattened out in terms of number of people in the health plan dropped and have moved up some uh, last year. But basically, we hit our peak in about 96 and have stayed around that. And the health plan, I wanna make sure, again, that you understand it's, it's both the traditional Medicaid program and people who would be covered under that. That's about 300,000 people. And then an another, what a few months ago was 100,000 people of adults who normally would not qualify. Um, we did on the fee-for-service side deal with decreases in provider, either holding flat or decreasing provider reimbursement. 
uh, we adopted a preferred drug list. We put into place some, some other prior authorization requirements. We've used all of the tricks that um, private insurance uses that we're allowed to use of really trying to constrain the cost of the health plan. But I think one thing important to know that the Oregon health plan doesn't drive the health care marketplace. We are experiencing the same kinds of increases that everyone is experiencing. We are, a, we are a, sometimes I like to say, a victim of the marketplace, but um, we, we are trying to deal with the issues as well. One of the things that you might be surprised about is that people think of Oregon Medicaid as being fairly luxurious. Well, um, if we look at, I believe this was, uh, excuse me, 2001 or 2002 data, uh, Oregon was 34th in Medicaid spending per state resident, and we were 44th in Medicaid spending per actual enrollee in Medicaid in the Oregon Health Plan. And that was before the cuts that we recently took, which I'll get to in a moment. Probably the most significant reform that we've undertaken in order to try to um, better control the cost of the health plan initiated in the 2001 session when I was actually off doing education, Representative Cruz was in the middle of of, of these negotiations around constructing what we called OHP2, the Oregon Health Plan 2. And the primary component of that was that we were going to split that Medicaid population into two different types of groups. Those traditionally eligible, they would receive the benefit package that had been received up until then, and those 100,000 or so adults under the poverty level, uh, who we then called the OHP Plus was the first group, OHP Standard the second, with the idea that the standard population would have something that looked much more like commercial insurance with some fewer benefits, co-pays, and, and premium requirements. Um, we began in February of this year. This was all planned before everything else hit the fan the last few months. Um, and when we began by changing that benefit package in February, what that did for those uh, about 90,000 at that point adults was eliminate vision coverage, eliminate coverage for medical equipment, uh, limit quite severely dental coverage, um, have mandatory co-pays, um, and then the premium requirement became again like a commercial. You don't pay your premiums, you lose your coverage. Um, the revenue shortfalls, though, that started, well, we've been undergoing, but between the November Emergency Board, the December revenue shortfall, and then the uh, defeat of Measure 28 caused significant further reductions to occur in March. And we basically used up all the flexibility the federal government provided us and the waivers they gave us last, last fall. So for that population, we, we eliminated then the dental coverage. We eliminated coverage for medical supplies. Perhaps most critically, and I'll get to some statistics in a moment, eliminated coverage for outpatient mental health and chemical dependency. Um, we eliminated prescription drug coverage. That was the only way for us to balance this budget. Um, when the legislature had its sixth special session, they reinstated funding for prescription drugs, but there was about a two-week period there where there was no prescription drug coverage. So at this point, basically for that part of the health plan group, um, there's hospital physician, lab and x-ray, and prescription drugs. Now, we've had a big drop in participation since February. We were up at about 90,000 for that group, and we're down now to about 64,000. A significant <coughs> part of that is the institution of the stricter uh, requirement around premiums. First month, that was in effect 14,000 dropped. The next month, I think the two months after that, about 4,000 each month. We also believe there are some people not coming in or not re-enrolling, perhaps because of the change in the benefit package or just confusion about what is going on. But let me step back for a moment and talk about what we've accomplished with the health plan and then where, where we may be today. The health plan really has done a lot in terms of both participation, some of the outcomes, the economic impact, and then the support it provides to clients who are receiving services in human services and public safety. I don't know if public safety refers to them as clients, but um, at current, or, well, the, the health plan reaches almost 12% of Oregon's population, and in many rural counties, it's much higher than that. I know at one point, um, back in the old days when, when I was in, in Medicaid, I think we were up in, in, for instance, in Josephine County, I think it was up over 20%. Um, since 1994, more than 1.4 million people have been covered by the health plan. 
more than 90,000 children have been covered under the Children's Health Insurance Program, which was instituted in the late 90s and comes under the health plan umbrella. We've had multiple studies that have really shown improved health outcomes for the people who are on the Oregon Health Plan. Um, has made significant impacts on, be believe it or not, even though your health insurance premiums are going up, uh, significant impacts on the cost shift. Uh, between 1994 and the year 2000, hospital charity care declined 53%. Um, the share of uninsured adults and children dropped from, uh, prior to the health plan overall, we were up at about 18% on insurance rate. That dropped down, and you can see, as you see people participating in the health plan, and again, it's on this great backgrounder here that the, that the health committee did. Uh, we were down to a low of about 10% uninsured, but now it has moved back up to we're somewhere between 13 and 14% uninsured. And I think that's both, I mean, the, the state has grown and the, eco the economics that we're dealing with um, certainly have affected that. And speaking of economics, this has had a significant impact on whether you know it or not on Oregon's, I would think on it's a significant impact on Oregon's economy. For about every dollar we spend in state money, there's a dollar fifty a federal match, and actually higher than that, that comes into the state. To give you a sense of how much money is going out, um, in May of this year, uh, the estimated expenditures uh, were 136 million, 51 million of that in the tri-county area alone. So in one month, over 50 million dollars going to this area, and that's going to hospitals, it's going to doctors, dentists, pharmacies, insurance companies, it's going to areas where those are good healthcare jobs there. So the health plan, yes, it's about the people who are receiving the services, but it's also about um, supporting um, the economy as well. One of the things we become increasingly cognizant of over the last few months with the cuts in the program have been the effect the health plan has in helping others who need supports. Within human services, in our self-sufficiency efforts, our welfare to work efforts, a number of the people who remain on the caseloads have mental health and, substance and or substance abuse problems. The Oregon Health Plan pays for that treatment, so it allows us to better use the available money we have uh, for other support services, such as, as uh, uh, work readiness classes. Um, in child welfare, drug abuse and alcohol abuse are the number one and number two reasons that children come into care. And in, in the year 2002, nearly 45% of founded abuse reports resulted from parental drug or alcohol abuse. Well, we realized when we moved to the dual benefit package, here's what happens when we cut alcohol and um, drug abuse and mental health treatment in March. A family has, has their children taken out of the home because there's an abuse situation. The parents are no longer eligible under traditional Medicaid because they don't have dependent children. So they are then in the standard package. But now they do not have mental health substance abuse treatment, which may be what they need in order to have their children return safely to their home. This has really put us in a position of trying to stretch the, the resources within child welfare. Um, I, I would predict that at some point we would, might see a lengthening of stay in foster care because of this, because of this is a, a real barrier for our child welfare staff. Um, I think that there's been, uh, the cuts have had a huge impact on the capacity or, of the provider system around alcohol and drug uh, abuse. Uh, one, one provider said 60 to 80 percent of their clinical population fit within the OHP standard population. And now they're at a place where I think she said, uh, we were getting people into services almost immediately. Now they're waiting six to eight weeks. By the time we can serve them, they're back in jail or their babies have been delivered. When we look at the law enforcement side, that as well has had, um, you don't think about the health plan and, and public safety. Um, but when those services were proposed to be eliminated, I remember a Judiciary Committee last fall where the people came in were the community corrections people uh, because they, in many cases, are under OHP standard and have significant issues. Um, there were 67 police departments that responded to a survey we conducted um, recently. 42% said they'd seen an increase in alcohol and drug and mental health related arrests. When we think about um, the corrections system, 80% of those entering prison have serious alcohol and drug problems. 
Upon release, they would typically enroll in health plan standard. So think about it. If they're not getting their treatment, uh, inmates who return to prison cost Oregon taxpayers $57,000 a year. And that is plus, there's figures from corrections, arrest, jail, adjudication, and post-prison supervision costs. So the health plan really has provided in many ways supports to a number of areas of, the, of our system. So here we are struggling trying to figure out what do we do with the health plan given our economic situation right now. And Representative Cruz and Representative Westland and Bates convened work groups beginning back in January or February to really strut. And at that time, we came to the realization that the funds that were in the governor's balanced budget weren't even enough to cover the mandatory Medicaid population with the mandatory services plus the services that I think we all have agreed are, are critical, prescription drugs, mental health, and chemical dependency. Well, there have been many struggles over the last few months, continue to be struggles. Uh, but in early June, and, and frankly, the congressional fiscal relief to states portion of the tax cut bill, I think, helped move along um, the discussions. But in the beginning of June, the governor, the Senate president, and the House speaker jointly sent a letter to Secretary uh, of HHS Tommy Thompson and said, we have, we've reached agreement on conceptual um, changes we'd like to see to the health plan. Basically, they said, we want to keep the people in the program, we want to continue to cover people under the poverty level, we want to continue the current benefits, but with a 30-line movement. Uh, we do want to change, in the standard population, though, we want to change what would be the minimum benefit package. We want to add back mental health and chemical dependency services. We want to add back an emergency dental uh, plan. We want to add back some medical supplies. But the exchange was that we would no longer be covering hospital coverage. Now, I think we would all like to be able to cover all of that. But if the question is, do you try to provide services that might keep people out of the hospital versus do you pay the hospital bill but not have services that might keep them out, those are some of the choices that are being made. Um, we've hit some bumps in the road the last couple of weeks. In fact, Representative Cruz and I, neither one of us had seen this morning's Oregonian article. And so we just got a copy of it so we could read so we can see how we were each quoted. Um, and so we hit some bumps, but I think the commitment is still there to try to, to keep together the plan that had been um, discussed in, in that letter. I think the, the real challenge now, I mean, as we look back on the Oregon Health Plan, certainly it's been good for Oregonians. It's been good for Oregon. It's been good for Oregon in terms of the economic impacts and the reduction in cost shift and the support it provides to people in other programs that are also publicly funded. Our challenge right now is to say, how do we get through this period of time and try to do what we can to serve those that we've committed to? And perhaps our dreams of getting to near universal coverage, uh, health care coverage are a ways off, but we want to try to keep the infrastructure in place so that when times do get better, we're at a place where we can build. I want to thank Jean for sticking to the game plan. We figured if we each talk long enough, there wouldn't be any time for questions. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, which is not a bad strategy. Um, Katie King also told me to say nice things about about um, Department of Human Services, and so I like the Department of Human Services that that fulfills that <laughs> obligation. Um, <laughs> well, it's better than nothing. So. Um, <laughs> It, it, it's nice to be here. I am a Southern Oregon Republican, so I'm a rarity in Portland. Um, and, and judging by the emails I get from folks in Portland, um, I'm not sure they really know what Southern Oregon Republicans are like, but, but I am one. Um, you know, I came into the legislature in, in 96. I, I, I've been involved in natural resource issues for the last close to 30 years. And I came into the legislature because I had a passion for natural resources, which explains why I've been chairing the Health and Human Services <laughs> Committee. Um, um, politics can take you some very interesting places. Um, but um, when, I, when I took over the chairmanship of the committee in 99, um, had a huge, steep learning curve. 
um, and I'm still learning. I think I've learned a fair amount, and I have developed a real passion for the subject area. And, um, and that passion isn't just during the session, it's, it's um, 12 months a year. And, and we've been involved in, in a whole lot of things. I was, Jean wasn't directly involved during the last legislative session, but she did chair a, a, a small little group called the Waiver Steering Committee that, that created the last waiver. So you can't totally escape, um, which, which had some interesting discussions in it also. Um, last session, we started looking at the Oregon Health Plan, and, and Gene pretty much, you know, the basic principles behind it included something that Congress said we couldn't do, and that was an employer mandate, which, which left a relatively big hole in, in our ability to fund something at an appropriate level. And, and so we started looking at it last session and looking at the exponential growth in the cost of the health plan and wondering how we are going to achieve something that was sustainable over time and something, because we were seeing a, a spiral in health care and a spiral in education as far as state general fund, and we were going to hit a nexus um, that was going to put us in a position of um, making a choice of educating kids or giving people health care, and it's really not a choice any of us wanted to have to make. So we tried to, we had, we had to start coming up with, with maybe a different way of, of doing things. And then, you know, then the economy tanked and, and um, kind of brought all of that discussion to a very direct point. And um, <coughs> so um, the Speaker of the House at the beginning of the session created a special committee. Um, it was chaired by Representative Westland, who last session was the co-chair of Ways and Means. and. Um, and, and it was a fairly full committee, but, but the real, the real br brain trust was um, Representative Westland, Bates, and Cruz, and um, otherwise self-named as the Three Stooges. <laughs> and um, Representative Bates was curly because he's totally bald, and I didn't quite qualify. Um, and, and we started having meetings um, in January. We, we created some stakeholder work groups and, um, and, and we were doing a dual track initially, and, and we would have our, our Monday and Thursday night meetings were on the health plan, our Tuesday, no, Monday and Wednesday, yeah. Tuesday and Thursday was, was the mental health system in the state, and um, um, both very simple topics to deal with, and so we were able to finish in a week. Mm -hmm. But, um, no, actually, we met continuously um, for over two months these work groups and um, and had some very interesting discussions um, the result of that work group was I happen to bring it um, House Bill 3624 okay um, our premise going into this thing because Gene was right we we weren't based on the governor's balanced budget even able to fund Medicaid. I mean, we, we could fund Medicaid, but if you wanted to add a few minor little things like mental health, CD, um, prescription drugs, and durable medical equipment, we, we were short. And uh, the early decision was made that yes, we want to have Medicaid in the state of Oregon, and yes, we want to have this level of a benefit package. And so, the whole purpose behind this piece of legislation is to make sure that we have a Medicaid program in Oregon. Now, to have a Medicaid program, you have to give, you have to be able to deliver services, a defined list of services to a defined population, okay? And um, so, so the focus of this was the categorical population. And I thought it was closer to 350. It, it, originally, the projection. Right, okay, I mean, um, and, and so this was the focus of our work, and, and we, uh, when, we f when we started out, because number one, the stakeholders, the first thing they want to go to is um, discussions of revenue, and, and we said, no, we aren't discussing revenue in this committee, we're s discussing structure, okay? And, and we were able pretty much to keep people on task with that, and, and, and we think I, I, to, to show you how open-minded we were on the front, of, front end of this thing, we went into this 
I'm not even assuming that managed care would still exist when we are done, okay? Um, we were willing to look at anything and any option that was available. Well, within the first month, we decided that managed care was basically, you know, kind of a byproduct of everything that had gone on the last 10 years. We now have 14 fully capitated health plans in the state of Oregon that are doing tremendous work. And, and we said, you know, wow, we, we have an asset here we need, we need to utilize. And, and so then we started having discussions about, um, okay, how do, we, how, do we, how do we expand these, these 14 wonderful things we have? And, and um, that got us into discussion about um, is there a way that we can move more of the fee-for-service population into managed care? And... Um, talking to the plans, and we said, can you take more folks? They said, yes. Um, you know, the difference, uh, and, and you, when you talk to the providers, they prefer managed care because um, the, the reimbursement rate's so much better. Um, part of the reason the fee-for-service reimbursement rate remains low is that there's no control on access to the system. And, and one of the things that's driven the cost of health care in this country has been an in, um, uh, huge increase in access to the system. All the new tests, all the new procedures, just everything that's available, people are using the healthcare system more than they did 20 years ago. Um, you know, so, so, so that was the premise we based all this on. Um, we had the benefit of the fact that the Health Service Commission had reconfigured the prioritized list, um, I think in, in an incredibly sound way that allowed us to consider dropping the line 30 points without eliminating uh, some, really, some really key services. And, and so that was helpful. Um, you know, but our goal was, our goal was to, um, to make this thing affordable. Um, we came within about $60 million of funding the basic program um, with the added benefits um, under the governor's budget. Um, nobody thought we could even get that close. But the things we did is um, we, looked, we looked at the, um, because the rates are set by a convoluted process that nobody understands, but it starts with actuarial reports from PricewaterhouseCoopers and then CMS plays in it and, and there's magic numbers up here. And, um, you know, and those magic numbers called for, I think, uh, somewhere in the neighborhood of 25, 22% increase. And so we said, oh, that's going to be expensive. And, and so, so being, being a simple country boy like I am, I thought, well, okay, if the providers are able to, to make this business at the current rates they got, one could assume that maybe they don't have to have a 22% increase in one year to still stay in business. So, so, so we had those conversations. And that's where things kind of get complicated because for CMS to approve a rate different from what the actuary said, um, there's a couple things that have to happen. But the biggest one is that we have to have the people that are going to receive the rate say, yeah, we're okay with that. So, so this is part of the negotiations that went on and that are still going on. Um, you know, I could go line by line through the bill, <laughs> um, but I won't. Um, like I said, we, we, we spent all together about three months creating this document. Um, I think it's one of the more significant pieces of legislation that will come out of this session. We passed it in the House. Um, oh, it's interesting, just a human interest thing. Um, at the time it was on the floor of the House of Representatives, Ben Westland was at St. Charles in Bend having a lung removed and um, because it, they had discovered he had cancer. and. Um, so Alan Bates and I carried it. It was, it was kind of an emotional thing for us because we had really been joined at the hip for three months. Um, by the way, Ben is back in Salem creating mischief and um, under, <laughs> he is, um, his doctors were, were as sure as doctors will ever be because doctors are never 100% sure of anything. 
um, that they had got the cancer, but Ben decided um, that he wanted to make absolutely sure, so he's currently undergoing radiation and chemo. So, um, and that's happening in Salem, um, reacting very well to it, by the way. So, um, um, so he's still in the building every day. Um, anyway, we passed the bill. We knew it still, it still had some problems, but, but Ben's surgery kind of accelerated the schedule a little bit. And so we passed the bill out of the House and sent it to the Senate. And the Senate spent two weeks on the bill and created the B in gross version of it. Um, I think they had um, 30 amendments that they, that they added to our bill. Um, some of them were good, by the way. Um, and so we spent the next three weeks after the Senate had made it a better bill, taking out a whole bunch of their stuff. And, um, <laughs> you know, politics is so wonderful. Um, taking out a whole bunch of their stuff, leaving some of it in, obviously. And, and we had come to consensus with them on the finished product about a week ago, except for, for one minor section, and that, that's the infamous section 12 in the bill, which deals with hospitals and plans and, and, and the hospitals taking patient, plan patients when there's not a contract and the hospitals and the plans reimbursing the hospitals who aren't under contract. It's, it's rather complicated. We've spent a long time on that. Um, I got the amendment to that section yesterday um, with some help from Dr. Bruce Goldberg, who I'm sure a lot of you know. And, um, and so we should have a C and gross version of the bill by Monday, um, and hopefully we'll have something on the governor's desk, um, maybe by the end of next week. So, um, because it, it has to pass out of ways and means. How much time? 30, 30. I'm out. Oh, heavens. Yeah, but they can still ask questions. Okay. Um, Gene, Gene brought up, I, I, I want to hit on one other small point here, and that is we have another bill in ways and means. It's House Bill 2511, which, which, details the populations and the benefits they get. One, uh, one of the boxes we found ourselves in in all of the adjustments to budgets last time is we ended up having to take huge blocks of stuff. And, and so we're trying to create a matrix under which um, for population X, we can buy benefit package Y. And, and we can do some mixing and matching. For example, um, we wouldn't, if we're going to buy durable medical equipment, we wouldn't have to buy everything under the sun. We can make sure that we we're buying diabetes supplies, oxygen, and some of the very core things if we couldn't afford everything else. So, and that's something that's still in the works. Um, we knew going into the session that the final resolution of all these issues would probably come the day before Sine Die, and it appears that Sine Die is no time soon, so we still have time to work on it. So. And Katie said I'm out of time, and I do want you guys to be able to a ask some questions, so I'll quit. Thank you. As you know, one of the benefits of being a club member is having the privilege of asking questions of our guest speakers. Our first question today, though, will come from Chris Smith, our board host. Uh, Chris Smith is lead uh, internet technologist at Xerox. At Xerox. Following uh, Chris's question, we'll ask for a question from the Health Air Issues Committee, and then we'll open it up to the uh, membership uh, as a whole. So uh, please line up behind the uh, microphones and state your name and make it a question and keep it to 30 seconds. Thank you. Thank you, Gene, Representative Cruz, for a very informative program, uh, setting kind of the history and context of the current decisions in front of us. Uh, I was struck by the parallels between uh, funding the health plan and funding education. The topic has got a lot of attention here at City Club in recent months, uh, and really the, how those two things are fundamental to having citizens who can really participate in our society that you know, neither are things we can do without. So my question is going to be about an analogy of something we've heard in, in the education funding debate. City Club is getting ready to do a study on education finance, and in writing the charge for that study, one of the messages we got from superintendents is that stability is perhaps even more important than the absolute funding level. And uh, Gene described kind of the changes that have happened to the health plan 
uh, over the last decade. And I'm curious, uh, what's the impact been on health outcomes of uh, the fact that the plan keeps changing biennium to biennium? Um, <clears throat> it's funny to talk about education. Having, now being the human services director and having spent the last five years working on education, you know, it's like, okay, I have 75% of the state budget. I just have to do corrections now that I've had <laughs> touched on. Um, you know, it's because it has been unstable the last, uh, especially the last year or so, it's hard to know how that may have affected um, health outcomes. I, I can say, though, that I think the, the studies that were done while we still had some stability um, greater rates of immunization, better prenatal care, uh, clients, uh, customer satisfaction, certainly better. Um, I think we've been, there's been so much turmoil over the last few months with people in and out of services. Um, I think that it will be a while before we can see what kind of, um, how that affects things. When we, when we first started the health plan, one of the things we wanted to do was make sure that we had people in care for a period of time. So rather than a month-to-month -month eligibility, we were guaranteeing a six-month eligibility. If you came in and you qualified, you would get coverage for six months. Um, there have also been proposals to take it to 12 months, but it's, it's very costly. But continuity of care is very important. Um, and I think we've seen when there is more continuous care that the health outcomes are better. It's a little too early to know, kind of given what's happened the last few months, how that may affect health outcomes. One other aspect of it, and something I was going to bring up, is is the biggest number of newly uninsured people are in Oregonian are those who have lost private sector coverage, and 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 that you know that's um, close to 500,000 people in the you know working poor, um, and it's one of our focuses in this is trying to create a system that because the old health plan basically created a, gl a glass ceiling for people. Um, because if you moved upward economically, you lost a lot. And so we're trying to create a system that allows people to, um, to succeed without penalty, more or less. And, and so that's been part of our focus in, in this whole thing is not just looking at the Medicaid system, but looking at health care in the state of Oregon so we know what, what impacts um, any action over here have on, on those people over here. And so, um, and we're also looking at, at the way we, we've structured health policy in the state and we're having discussions about making sure that that's a more global perspective so that, so, you know, my whole thing has been um, the working poor have been ignored in all this and it's time that they, they hit front and center stage. Uh, yes, I'm Ted Falk, and I'm co-chair of the City Club's Healthcare Issues Committee. And both uh, Gene and Jeff, you have uh, mentioned managed care as as being one of the principles of the Oregon Health Plan for, uh, from the beginning. And since you've seen this morning's paper, you're aware that there seems to be a little debate about whether managed care saves money. So my question for you is: Number one, what are the what, if any, are the savings from managed care? And then question number two. Why is question number one so difficult to answer? Because <laughs> we have actuaries involved. Um, when we went back, I mean, when we started this session, I think that, that Representative Cruz and Bates and Westland had real questions about does this make sense? And, and, and first of all, going back, I think from our perspective, one of our primary reasons from our, the administration's perspective was to get people to manage care was to assure access, ensure coordination of care. When we went back and looked at a period of time um, to see what kind of differences there were, um, there was a savings from managed care. But what has happened now as we look forward with a projected 22% increase in managed care, um, that then makes, at least over the next two year period, managed care more expensive. Um, but I think that the question is, what do we think will happen in fee-for-service? Um, and will people be able to have access to care in fee-for-service? So I think is, I think there is, there's a commitment towards having managed care and more managed care. I mean, we've been doing this since 85. And um, part of it is, is trying to deal with issues, for instance, around rates, what is reasonable, so that we are not at a place where it ends up costing us, at least in this next two-year budget period, more money. The other thing, and this is a technical issue, is you move people from fee-for-service to managed care, 
we're still paying their old fee-for-service bills while we're prospectively paying fee-for-service. So whenever we move more people in, there are one-time costs, and I think that was about 15 million of the additional cost. There's also the fact, and it gets to the more global perspective, is um, there's, there's no providers out there taking fee-for-service because um, it doesn't pay enough to even make it worthwhile. And, and, and so th that becomes a tremendous cost shift uh, when that happens. So. Recently, when the medication was cut back for recipients, um, a lady leaning on a car was trying to get to a hospital because the di um, insulin for diabetes was taken away from her, and she was hoping the hospital could apply it, which seems an extremely expensive way to save money. Um, and this morning, for instance, I learned that this man who was 80 and receiving hospice asked for comfort care only, and so they took away his oxygen because they said that would maintain his life rather than his comfort. Uh, these kind of things really, um, a friend refused insulin, it took him three days to die. A kidney dialysis, it took three weeks for him to die. And a young lady who lived above me refused food and it took her seven months. Personally, I believe the Death with Dignity Act is not enough. I don't like this assisted murder, in a sense, uh, when you deny them medication that's essential. What, uh, what do you think of an extended blood donation, which is very euphoric, a way to die? Uh, you have the control to even put your blood back in if you change your mind. Um, and then the body parts can be used to allow other people to live. Um, I think we should pursue, this would it, get around our Ashcroft objection to medication. What do you think of that? I, I guess I'm not too clear on what the, the question is here. I think some of the examples you provide, um, we have, through some of the program changes that have been made, there are the kinds of consequences that I'm sure you've talked about. Um, we have, unfortunately, we can't, we don't have the authority to pick and choose and to save for a particular person. We will provide durable medical equipment, but for the rest we won't, for instance. One of the examples you give does not, I mean, if someone's 80 years old, they would not have been affected, there weren't any health plan services cut for that, so I'm not sure about that, but I think that I mean, we need to we need to acknowledge that our, our health care system. There's 400,000 Oregonians who have absolutely no health care coverage at all, and there are issues. I mean, this is a broader issue than just Medicaid. It is an issue. I mean, it's both how the Medicaid program or the health plan is structured, as well as what about the other 400,000 who most of them who are under 200 percent of poverty. Cy Cornbrook, City Club member and member of the Health Care Committee. We were told a number of times that the most expensive way to enter the health care system is the use of the emergency room, and people that don't have insurance do that. And of course, that gets passed on to all of us who have health care in higher and higher premiums. And at some point, some people have to get off health care. At what point? Is it more economical to fund health care for those who can't afford it than keep passing it on and have more and more people dropping out of the system? <laughs> that's, that's, that's actually the issue we're dealing with right now. Uh, when I talked about trying to come up with making sure that, that decisions made here, we know what the impacts are over here. and, and you know, that's, that's, what, that's what we've been wrestling with is if, you know, we could walk away from the standard population and guess what, balance the budget and go home tomorrow, but the impacts on the private sector are huge, so we can't do that. So the question is, is uh, what do we fund and what the impacts are? And, and you know, it, it's not an easy question. It's an easy question. It's, it's a hard answer, and, and it's one we've been struggling with for quite a while now, and I don't know the answer to it. I, I think, you know, it's interesting during the 
fifth special session, there was a special Senate committee on the health plan. Mm -hmm. I always said it's because they were waiting for the House to do revenue. They didn't have anything else to do in the Senate, Pretty so they much. figured they'd, they'd have a committee on the health plan. <laughs> and I know one of the questions I was asked is similar. Well, why should we be? Do why should we, as a state, be covering these hundred thousand people at the time? And I said, you know, he says, is it does it save the state money? I said, well, the I mean, there's if you want to ask, does it save state government money? Um, I think to some degree it does. If we have um, reduced um, prison, you know, some of the, some of the issues I talked around, around child welfare, self-sufficiency, and public safety, and also state government as an employer. But frankly, it's good for the state because we are then, there are less costs being shifted to the private sector. But the difficulty is when you have constrained revenues, um, can the legislature afford, can we afford, unfortunately, to say, well, it may not save state government that, but it is something that is for the good of the state. David Roth, member. Uh, Obviously, the uh, employer mandate was a very important part of the original plan. Uh, my understanding had been that it was basically squelched during the 93 legislative session when the Republicans took over both houses. Now, I gather from a remark that uh, Mr. Cruz made that it wasn't uh, a, an inactivity by the legislature, but actually a declaration by the feds that prohibited an employer mandate. Could you clarify that? Yeah, we can uh, under ERISA, rem somebody remembers what it stands for. Um, <laughs> we cannot actually impose a mandate for them to provide. The only state that's been able to do that was Hawaii, and I think it's before ERISA was passed. But the way we were structuring it was a pay or play, the way we had planned it. So either you pay or you had to, uh, uh, either you play or you pay into a state pool. In the 93 session, as part of the kind of end game negotiations on, I'm looking at ex Senator Shoemaker, um, on, on the bill, um, the Associated Oregon Industries was able to insert language that if we did not get congressional approval for an ERISA waiver um, prior to, I think it was January 1, 95, it would be um, voided. That part of the law would be voided, and or may have even been January 1, 94. And so there was, in essence, then no further work on that. So it, you know, could we have done a pay or play under ERISA? Um, I think, I mean, many of us thought we could have. We probably, we probably would have been challenged about doing that, though. Thank you. Uh, Ray Polani, a member. Uh, crisis equal opportunity. Uh, we need more money. And. I would suggest, how about a radical change? Why don't we let the voters decide to eliminate the highways only excise tax restriction in favor of adding it to the general fund? That could be another Oregon first. It would lead the Congress. It would shame the Congress. Are highways more important than health care? education, public safety, and on and on. Let's copy the rest of the world, and let's use the gasoline excise tax as a source of revenue to provide services. The question is, would you comment on it? <laughs> Since that's not a human service issue, I'll let Representative Cruz comment on it. Um, to say, to say highways are not important, um, talk to the folks on the last bridge that collapsed. Um, you know, we, we've got demonstrable need for our highway dollars and, and um, you know, let's, let's keep in mind, folks, that we are in a recession and, and government doesn't pull us out of a recession, the economy does. And, and so we need to make sure that we're doing things that are gonna kick start this economy and, and to, take, to take dollars away from from a, from a transportation system that's in huge need of a whole lot of things, I don't think um, long-term makes sense. We have time for one more question. Claire Kodosky, City Club member. We see that Oregon is 10th in the nation in prison spending. We're spending about a billion dollars every two years on prisons. What do you see the effect of Measure 11 on our community services? 
Well, I mean, I can look back. I don't have all the statistics with me, but the percentage of the state budget going to public safety has certainly increased over the, the last few years. And, and I think within public safety, it's been corrections, not the state police, as, as you noticed, in, or, or the courts. Um, I think that the, the percentage of spending on human services has stayed relatively constant. Um, education has stayed, actually K-12 has stayed relatively constant. I think the area, again, is a percentage of the state budget. I think the area that appears that the, the most dramatic offsetting effect occurred was in post-secondary education, that the proportion of the state budget that goes to community colleges and higher education has definitely dropped in the years that the, the public safety spending has gone up. So I think, I mean, it, the Measure 11 certainly creates additional pressures, and between Measure 5 and Measure 11 and 47 and 50, um, there, you know, there are certainly constraints around what we can do. I mean, people say take it out of something. Don't take it out of education, human services, or public safety. Well, that's 90-some percent of the budget right there. Uh, small correction, measure 50 was a correction to measure 47. So that's, um, <laughs> you know, but, but, but that does bring up a point. Um, you know, as, as, a, as a state legislator, whether I agree with it or not, if the, if the voters pass something, I'm compelled to enact it and make it work. Um, on a personal level, um, I've been involved in several of those things. I'm now, you know, I'm now the marijuana guy in the legislature because, um, and God only knows why. <laughs> Must be a great story there, right? <laughs> well, well, I mean, you know, the, voter, the voters passed the initiative and, and we've had two sessions now to try to craft the program and I foolishly put my name on both bills. So, um, <laughs> and so whenever anybody in the state has, has a question on medical marijuana, they call me, it's just a joy. In fact, I have a, I have a whole file um, in my email just for marijuana, but, um, <laughs> you know. Well, thank you. Well, I guess when we have our marijuana program, we'll invite you back. But, uh, <laughs> but clearly, as uh, Representative Cruz said, in the healthcare area, there are a lot of easy questions, but there aren't, very ma there aren't many easy answers. Um, City Club is adjourned. Thanks.